Welcome to Euro PCR 2018 to PCR TV. I'm Ziad Ali from Columbia University Medical Center, and I'm joined here by my friends and colleagues, Jonathan Hill from King's College, and Azim Latib from San Rafael Hospital in Milan. Gentlemen, welcome. Azim, is coronary artery calcification still a problem? It's a great question, Ziad. Uh, it's great being here. I think, you know, it's still one of those really unmet needs we have in cardiology. I don't think we have a great solution. You know, we try with calcified lesions, cutting balloons, scoring balloons, etherectomy. Um, etherectomy can be quite complicated and hasn't been widely adopted by a lot of centers. It requires a lot of skill. And so we still don't have a solution, uh, an easy solution that's easily used by a lot of operators. And I think we know that calcified lesions are associated with worse outcomes, stent under expansion, increased revascularization. So I'm delighted here to talk about a novel technology for calcified lesions. Right, so we have a new weapon in our artillery and that's the shockwave coronary intravascular lithotripsy system. This is a device that consists of a console, catheter, and a connector that's compact and rechargeable, simple and quick and intuitive and safe. The technology is a balloon-based system which actually utilizes a technology that's been around for years, lithotripsy, and in incorporated into a balloon catheter. Inside the balloon catheter, the lithotripsy is active, creating an acoustic pulse. That acoustic pulse is useful for vessel preparation, allowing when the acoustic pulse cavitates on itself, a high energy release that can modify calcific plaque. And this is an example shown on the slide where an acoustic bubble is formed following which the cavitation releases energy into the vessel wall yet remains safe in the confines of the vessel wall itself. John, you were involved in the Disrupt CAD study, mm -hmm. the first in man study using intravascular lithotripsy. Tell us of your experience in the trial as well as with the technology. So it's about 60, 60 patients treated, um, half a dozen centers, uh, mostly in Europe. Um, and we were treating lesions that perhaps we would otherwise have uh, selected for rotational atherectomy. Patients with very densely calcified vessels uh, we assessed angiographically. And a large number of the patients we then subsequently evaluated with OCT and we were able to assess the, the calcium burden uh, within the vessel. And I think every investigator involved in this first study had a kind of eureka moment when the balloon was in, inflated at low pressure, four atmospheres, perhaps within a lesion that was previously undilatable, and pressing the button for the first time and the balloon popping the lesion open at four atmospheres. Uh, though that happened over and over again. We saw the eff immediate effects of lithotripsy in, in really every case. And I think we, we, we understood the mechanism of action, uh, the effects of the, the shock wave within the wall of the artery. And I, I think the, the use of OCT to assess the mechanism, mechanism of action, I think, was, was really uh, key. Right, so as you know, John, they say a picture is worth a thousand mm. words, and this was a perfect example of this. When we performed the OCT sub-study for the Disrupt CAD study, we found a large increase in the number of calcium fractures. And what was particularly interesting is the more the calcium, the more the fractures, sure. suggesting that we may be able to provide a more robust and greater magnitude of plaque modification than we could previously perform. So the idea, when these acoustic waves go to the, towards the wall, how many atmospheres are they creating of pressure? I mean, just to give people an idea. So typically the balloon is inflated only at four atmospheres in order okay. to minimize barotrauma, which we think is one of the predictors of poor outcome. Very high pressure can obviously damage the vessel wall. But once the cavitation bubble is released, we are in the order of 20 times of normal atmospheric pressure that we would normally be able to get. So magnitudes higher than an ordinary non-compliant balloon. Okay. So I think this is particularly one of the advantages that we have in be able to perform vessel preparation. So John, describe to us one of your recent cases where you used intravascular lithotripsy and found it to have a major impact on patient care. So, I mean, we've got this case here. This is a, a, an, an everyday 
Maybe a sort of slightly harder than average case, a bit, a bit more complex. Uh, this is a, uh, if you see in the, the left-hand panel here at baseline, um, a calcified vessel. In fact, this, this had previously been attempted with a, a non-compliant balloon inflated to a very high pressure. And so this is the, the type of sort of dog-boned balloon appearance that sort of characterizes the calcific rings that we, we see in, the, in these, these types of vessel. And so what we were able to do in this particular case um, was to, it, the, the first lesion, so in the, in the middle of the, these uh, three lesions, you can see the dog bone effect within that first lesion, a single pulse and the lesion then pops open. We then pulled the balloon back. Um, you see the second lesion we treated again, the heavily sort of dog boned appearance, 20 pulses, and so that's two pushes of the button. Uh, the balloon is at four atmospheres and it pops open. Now we then used the balloon to deliver the uh, litho lithotripsy balloon down to the more distal lesion. So I was able to then completely engage the, a, a guide liner down to the distal lesion at three. Again, very heavily uh, calcified segment, tightly constrained. And again, with some more energy delivery, that balloon then is fully expanded. And then you can see the stented result looks really, really you know, fantastic. very satisfactory. Azim, tell me about your eureka moment in this case. Yeah. So, you know, this was a patient referred to Antonio and myself, um, a really elderly patient with this huge chunk of calcification in the distal left main, predominantly going towards the circumflex. And initially, we, were, we had a lot of discussion, what, we, what, what would we do with this patient? He had a low ejection fraction, 25%, and traditionally, we would have done rotational atherectomy. Um, but we were quite concerned, elderly patient, not great peripheral vascular access. Um, would we have issues with doing rotablation with a low ejection fraction? And we really thought we'd try lithotripsy. Uh, I think we, we were pushing it, we didn't know if it will work because, I mean, it's dramatic how much calcification there is. Um, and you see on the pictures that, you know, we went to sort of the low pressure that's um, advised using this device, applied the, lithotrips the, the lithotripsy and, you know, with each balloon you can give up to 80 impulses. So we really use the balloon to really treat that area and try and impact the calcification, um, hoping to fracture it or at least change the compliance of the calcification. We then, because we were surprised that we saw full expansion, uh, went with a non-compliant balloon, almost as a test to confirm that it would fully expand um, before putting a stent in. Uh, we didn't want to end up with you know, what we sometimes call stent regret, where you put an underexpanded stent in. Mm. And the stent expanded exceptionally well. Uh, the patient tolerated the procedure. We didn't need any hemodynamic support. And I think the other advantage was we were able to protect the LAD the whole time mm. while doing this. So, yeah. you know, we could treat a bifurcation lesion with two wires and really treat a very osteal lesion at the circumflex, which all of us know mm. is a challenging lesion sure. to treat. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm very envious that intravascular lithotripsy is now available in Europe. As you know, it's not available in the US. I would like to ask you both a question as we close. Where does intravascular lithotripsy fit in the armamentarium against calcification? Is it now the first line therapy? Do we still need atherectomy? And where does it compare to specialty balloons? John, I'm gonna start with you. So I think it's going to lower our threshold for selection of a specialty calcium modifying device. So if you're, if you're looking at the sort of reference point would be, what, do I use an, a, a non-compliant balloon? So if you're then thinking, well, I need to reach for a cutting balloon or some other kind of a, an angiosculpt, that type of thing. Um, you actually, I think lithotripsy would be the first thing you'll reach for. So I think it's going to open up the possibility of calcium modification to a much wider group of interventionists. It's a much more accessible and easier to use device than rotational atherectomy. I don't think it's going to do away with rotational atherectomy. I think there's going to be a, still a proportion of cases where rotational atherectomy will be required. But I think it's going to broaden the scope of calcium modification. Azim, how easy is it to use this device? Yeah. So I think if you know how to use a balloon, you can use this device, right? And I think that's the advantage. I think, you know, 
if I look at my own practice, and, I, and I'm sure it's the same for you guys, uh, there's a lot more calcified lesions we're treating. We're treating elderly patients mm -hmm. with more calcified lesions, and I'm using more and more adjunctive devices for calcification. Mm -hmm. And I'm still surprised how atherectomy hasn't become a, a procedure that's become very diffuse. A lot of centers still are quite reluctant. So I think this is a device we can put into people's hands that anybody can use who knows how to use a balloon. Okay. Um, I think we'll see you know, further generations of this device develop with time, which will make it even easier to use with better profiles. Mm -hmm. I would agree with Jonathan that I don't think it will completely replace atherectomy. I still see a place for atherectomy mm -hmm. in uncrossable lesions. Mm -hmm. So that lesion where you really can't get there with the balloon, you may still want to use atherectomy. Um, but this is a safe device to use. So I think the thing that's amazed me the most was, you know, we haven't seen perforations yet. We haven't seen extensive mm -hmm. uh, dissections uh, or large periprocedural infarcts uh, when we use the device. So I'm looking forward to using it in more real world cases, you know, really pushing the technology, trying to use it in more long calcified lesions, left mains, and uh, these kind of bifurcations. Well, we're fortunate that we have the Disrupt CA2 study coming up, which is going to be involve a larger patient population, more centers as this becomes rolled out. I would like to thank both of you gentlemen for joining me at PCR TV and enjoy the remainder of your PCR 2018. Thanks, yeah. Thank you.